All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're taking Ezekiel chapter 23, the sins and judgment of you know Samaria and the kingdom of Israel. We're going to see two symbolic sisters here, Ahola and Ol, uh, Aholiba. And we'll just jump right into the first four verses. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, <clears throat> Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother. They committed harlotry in Egypt. They committed harlotry in their youth. Their breasts were there embraced. Their virgin bosom was there pressed. Their names, Ahola the elder, and Holiba her sister. They were mine, and they bore sons and daughters. As for their names, Samaria is Ahola, and Jerusalem is Aholiba. So Ezekiel 23 is going to present these two symbolic sisters representing the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And the story of two sisters is not a perfect illustration of the relationship between God and Israel. The Lord did not have two wives, but the story is of two sisters. Um, it's going to be a powerful description of how Judah followed in the sinful steps of Israel. And there are many parallels between chapter 16 and 23. Both chapters confront Israel as an unfaithful wife to God, uh, but there are also important differences. The mood set by the opening lines contrasts sharply with chapter 16, which had intentionally evoked great sympathy for the uh, foundling in the minds of the hearers, and the women introduced here are not to be pitied. So Ezekiel states a theme that's going to be repeated several times in this chapter, uh, and that is that Israel was unfaithful to God from the very start, worshiping idols in Egypt. Symbolically, their worship of Egyptian idols was like giving their bodies to those gods. And while they were still in Egypt, God told Israel to forsake the Egyptian idols, and they did not in Ezekiel chapter 20. And as previously noted in chapter 20, there were several evidences of Israel's idolatry in Egypt. The worship of the golden calf at Mount Sinai in Exodus 32, Idolatry practice in Egypt, right? Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord in Joshua 24. And the choice of golden calves as objects of worship by Jeroboam in 1 Kings chapter 12. <clears throat> so God gave these two symbolic sisters names. The elder was Ahola, which means her own tabernacle, with the sense that she rejected God's temple and the service that attended it. The younger was Oholiba, which means my tabernacle is in her, with the sense that she was home to God's temple and its service. So both incorporate the word Ohel, or tent, Ohola suggesting her own tent, and Oholiba, my tent in her. And so these sisters belong to God by the principles of election, redemption, and marriage covenant, and they were mothers to many sons and daughters. And so, to avoid any misunderstanding, God stated it very clearly. Ahola represented Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, and Oholiba represented Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah. He just spells it out right there for you. All right, verse 5 through 8, the story of Ahola, the elder sister. So, <clears throat> verse 5. Ahola played the harlot, even though she was mine, and she lusted for her lovers, the neighboring Assyrians who were clothed in purple, captains and rulers, all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding on horses. Thus she committed her harlotry with them, all of them choice men of Assyria, and with all for whom she lusted, with all their idols she defiled herself. She has never given up harlotry brought from Egypt, for in her youth they had lain with her, pressed her virgin bosom, and poured out their immorality upon her. So once again, God used the idea of harlotry to symbolically express the idolatry of Israel. In particular, the northern kingdom of Israel gave herself to idolatry from the start in 1 Kings 12. And before the Assyrians conquered Israel, she followed her attraction to their gods, their power, protection, and their ways. This repeats an irony that's expressed before in Ezekiel. When God's people reject God and embrace the idols of other nations... He allows those nations to conquer his people. <clears throat> so we can imagine the small kingdom of Israel looking in awe and envy upon the mighty empire of the Assyrians. And though they feared them, they also noticed their power and wealth, their influence and fame. Israel thought that by worshiping Assyria's gods and adopting their morals 
and embracing their customs, they could they could gain some of that power and fame. So they foolishly rejected their own covenant God uh, and embraced idolatry instead. <clears throat> and so the black obelisk of Shalamanzer III illustrates Jehu prostrating himself before the Assyrian king. The date would be about 840 BC at the beginning of Jehu's reign and offering gifts, possibly with a view to buying support against Hazael of Damascus. And so Second Kings will also describe the paying of tribute by Israel to Assyria in the reigns of uh, Menahem in 745 to 738 BC and Hosea in 732 to 724 BC. You can see Second Kings chapter 15 and chapter 17. So there was nothing holy or even spiritual in Israel's attraction to the Assyrians and their gods. It was purely on a fleshly, materialistic basis. Horses and horsemen were mentioned because of the Assyrians, as the Egyptians used cavalry prominently. And so the idea from Ezekiel 23, verse 3, is repeated specifically for Ahola, the kingdom of Israel. She started out by giving herself to Egyptian idols and continued giving herself to the idols of the nations. All right, verse 9 and 10, judgment upon Ahola. Verse 9, Therefore I have delivered her into the hands of her lovers, into the hand of the Assyrians, for whom she lusted. They uncovered her nakedness, took away her sons and daughters, and slew her with the sword. And she became a byword among women, for they had executed judgment on her. So because Israel gave herself to foreign gods and morals, God allowed them to be conquered by those foreign nations. It was God's way of saying, you reject me and lust after these, now you're going to be conquered by them and live under them. And so the Assyrians, uh, when they conquered Israel in 722 BC, they did this. They took away the sons and daughters, slew, slew them with the sword, uncovered the nakedness. Assyria humiliated Samaria and Israel, took her sons and daughters captive, killed many with the sword. And this was well known to Ezekiel's listeners and readers, having happened more than 100 years before. Samaria and Israel had become a byword for well-deserved judgment. All right, verse 11 to 13. Oholiba, or Jerusalem, imitates the sins of Ahola, or Samaria. Okay. All right, verse 11. Now, although her sister Oholiba saw this, she became more corrupt in her lust than she, and in her harlotry more corrupt than her sister's harlotry. She lusted for the neighboring Assyrians, captains and rulers, clothed most gorgeously, horsemen riding on horses, all of them desirable young men, and then I saw that she was defiled, both took the same way. So there was at least one significant way that the sins of Jerusalem were much worse than the sins of Samaria. Jerusalem had the example of Samaria to take warning from and to learn by, but they did not. They saw Samaria's sin and the judgment that came upon her, yet they just followed right in the same footstep. And so, in the end, Jerusalem was more depraved than Samaria. Ezekiel will develop that theme starting in verse 16. And even as the northern kingdom of Israel lusted after Assyrian power, wealth, fame, and influence, so did the southern kingdom of Judah. Jerusalem lusted for the material and fleshly emblems of that mighty empire the same way as Samaria in Ezekiel 23. They were both defiled, both took the same way. So King Ahaz of Judah gave gifts and made an alliance with the Assyrians in 2 Kings 16. The prophet Isaiah spoke against this lust for the neighboring Assyrians in Isaiah chapter 7. And he went up to Damascus to meet uh, tiglath pileser king of Assyria. And he saw there an altar he thought was the prettiest altar he'd ever seen. So he sent Urijah the priest to get the pattern of it in order to make one just like it in 2 Kings 16. All right, verse 14 through 16, Oholiba, or Jerusalem, surpasses the sins of Ohola, or Samaria. All right, verse 14, but she increased her harlotry. She looked at men portrayed on the wall, images of Chaldeans portrayed in vermilion, girded with belts around their waist, flowing turbans on their heads, all of them looking like captains in the manner of the Babylonians of Chaldea, the land of their nativity. As soon as her eyes saw them, she lusted for them and sent messengers to them in Chaldea. Alright, so it was bad enough that Jerusalem imitated the sins of Samaria. It's far worse that she increased her rejection and rebellion. And the media of the day, um, of that day, gave the people of Jerusalem the enticements to go after the morals, customs, and idols of the Babylonians. The images of the Chaldeans seduced them to follow their sins even as they had previously done with the Assyrians in Ezekiel 23. 
verse 12 and 13. And so, and so rich clothes are often fine covers of the foulest shame. If every silken suit covered a sanctified soul, it would be brave. And so this probably, the land of their nativity, is going to refer to the fact that according to Genesis chapter 11, verse 27 to 32, Abraham, the father of all Jewish peoples, originally came from Chaldea, the region of Babylon, and God called Abraham out of Babylonian idolatry. Now his descendants returned to it. And long before the Babylonians conquered Judah, they sent receptive messengers to her. They pursued the Babylonians, and eventually the same Babylonians conquered the people of Judah. All right, verse 17 to 21, the disgusting idolatry and immorality of Jerusalem. Verse 17. Then the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love, and they defiled her with their immorality. So she was defiled by them and alienated herself from them. She revealed her harlotry and un uncovered her nakedness. Then I alienated myself from her, as I had alienated myself from her sister. Yet she multiplied her harlotry in calling to remembrance the days of her youth. When she had played the harlot in the land of Egypt, for she lusted for her paramours, whose flesh is like the flesh of donkeys, and whose issue is like the issue of horses. Thus you call to remembrance the lewdness of your youth, when the Egyptians press your bosom because of your youthful breast. So Ezekiel continues with the familiar theme using gross sexual promiscuity to illustrate Jerusalem's idolatry. This was accurate as a spiritual illustration, but it was also connected to literal, uh, the literal reality because many of these rites connected to Babylonian idols were sexual in nature, especially sex with prostitutes representing the idol. And so if a Christian choose worldly prosperity or his own reputation or any earthly object apart from God, it is through this that he will suffer. The things that he has loved will be raised up against him, just as Israel, that had dallied with Babylon, was carried away into captivity to Babylon. So, a faithful husband would distance himself from a promiscuous wife. Even so, God alienated himself from Jerusalem as he had previously done in regard to Samaria. And God disciplined Jerusalem by distancing himself from her. Her response was to return to her roots, to the idolatry of her youth, when she had played the harlot in the land of Egypt. And Jerusalem ran after her idol lovers in the most gross and disgusting ways. Ezekiel said she lusted after their potency, represented by large sexual organs uh, and large emissions of semen. And so the idea was that potent, mighty people could protect Judah. Ezekiel is using this shocking language to jolt his complacent and jaded listeners and readers. And so Ezekiel's language here is admittedly coarse in nature, and it's apparently more so in the original Hebrew. Yet the modern preacher should note that he did not use the coarse terms to entertain his listeners and readers, nor to make himself seem contemporary and cool. The coarse language was used to shock and to reflect God's own disgust with Jerusalem's sins. Furthermore, this coarse language stands out for its rarity, and its use should never be used to justify any kind of regular use in the pulpit or even everyday conversation. All right, verse 22 through 27, judgment on uh, Aholabah. Therefore, Aholabah, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will stir up your lovers against you, for whom you have alienated yourself, and I will bring them against you from every side, the Babylonians, all the Chaldeans, Pekad, Shoah, Koah, all the Assyrians with them, all them desirable young men, governors and rulers, captains of men of renown, all of them riding on horses, and they shall come against you with chariots, wagons, and war horses, with a horde of people, they shall array against you." buckler, shield, and helmet all around. I will delegate judgment to them, and they shall judge you according to their judgments. I will set my jealousy against you, and they shall deal furiously with you. They shall remove your nose and your ears, and your remnant shall fall by the sword. They shall take your sons and your daughters, and your remnant shall be devoured by fire. They shall also strip you of your clothes, and take away your beautiful jewelry." 
Thus I will make you cease your lewdness and your harlotry brought from the land of Egypt, so that you will not lift your eyes to them, nor remember Egypt any more. So God's judgment against Jerusalem was all the more deserved because they were Ahulabah, meaning my tabernacle is in her. The great blessing of the temple and the priesthood in their midst made their accountability much greater. Right? How much is our accountability for what's revealed to us today? Right? Even more so. So Jerusalem and Judah would find that those they gave themselves to would not treat them well, and they would come against Olaba from every side with officers and leaders from many nations. They would come with powerful weapons and instruments of war. And uh, those who had previously come to her to make love now come from all sides to make war. And so the armies assembled against Jerusalem would not treat her gently or like lovers. They would kill or maim her, strip her of her beautiful clothes and jewelry. So the severe judgment of the conquest of Jerusalem and the exile would be like strong medicine to the Jewish people. They would no longer run after their idle lovers as they did before. The last remnants of the sins brought from the land of Egypt would be purged and forgotten. Verse 28 to 31, Jerusalem delivered over those who hate her. Verse 28, For thus says the Lord God, Surely I will deliver you into the hand of those you hate, into the hand of those from whom you alienated yourself. They will deal hatefully with you. Take away all you have worked for, and leave you naked and bare. The nakedness of your harlotry shall be uncovered, both your lewdness and your harlotry. I will do these things to you, because you have gone as a harlot after the Gentiles, because you have become defiled by their idols. You have walked in the way of your sister, therefore I will put her cup in your hand. So though Jerusalem went after the nations and their gods as if they were her lovers, there was never real love between them. They were never lovers that truly desired the best for each other. Jerusalem wanted to get uh, what she could get from the nations and their idols, and they wanted the same from her. Jerusalem would suffer the terrible fate of being given over to the one she hated. And so instead of love and glory, glory uh, Jerusalem and Judah would find shame. They had not benefited or had been blessed by their idolatry. They became defiled by the idols. And so more than a hundred years before, Samaria and Israel fell against the invading Assyrians. Now Jerusalem and Judah would suffer the same fate, drinking from the same cup of judgment. So being Aholaba, having the temple, instead of Ahola, rejecting the temple, made no difference if it did not result in faithfulness to God and His covenant. If the people of Jerusalem thought having the temple would save them from judgment, that God would never allow the Babylonians to destroy the temple, they needed to learn from the story of Ahola and Aholaba. Right? Verse 32-35, to 35, Drinking Samaria's Cup. Verse 32, Thus says the Lord God, You shall drink of your sister's cup, the deep and wide one. You shall be laughed to scorn and held in derision. It contains much. You will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, the cup of horror and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria. You shall drink and drain it. You shall break its shards and tear at your own breast. For I have spoken, says the Lord God. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have forgotten me and cast me behind your back, therefore you shall bear the penalty of your lewdness and your harlotry. So Jerusalem will not only hold Samaria's cup of judgment, uh, they're going to drink it as well, and the cup of judgment is deep and wide one. It's going to contain much, and so the onlooking nations are going to offer no sympathy. They're only going to offer scorn and derision. And the cup that Samaria drank was terrible, as the record of the city's last days showed in 2 Kings 17. Now Jerusalem's going to drink the same cup of judgment, and they needed to drink and drain it. In their misery, they were going to harm themselves. <clears throat> And this great penalty would come upon Jerusalem and Judah because they forgot God and wanted him to disappear. Ignoring God and wanting to have nothing to do with him is a great sin, and it's worthy of judgment. Verse 36-39, through 39, some of the specific sins of Ahola, or Samaria, and Aholaba, Jerusalem. The Lord also said to me, Son of man, will you judge Ahola and Aholaba? Then declare to them their abominations, for they have committed adultery. The blood is on their hands. They have committed adultery with their idols, and even sacrificed their sons whom they bore to me, passing them through the fire to devour them. Moreover, they have done this to me. They have defiled my sanctuary on the same day and profaned my Sabbaths. For after they had slain their children for their idols, on the same day they came into my sanctuary to profane it, and indeed thus they have done in the midst of my house." 
So God has thus far spoken mostly in a symbolic way about the sins of Samaria and Jerusalem, using the figure of sexual immorality to illustrate their idolatry. Now God will speak directly and literally about their sins. And they're unfaithful to the marriage covenants and unfaithful to their communities, committing adultery and practicing violence under the cover of the law. They sacrifice their children in tribute to the terrible idol Moloch, burning their infants to death. And they would offer their children to Moloch on one of the Sabbaths, and on the same day go to the temple to profane it. Verse 40 through 45, the comfortable harlotry of the lewd sisters. Verse 40, Furthermore, you sent for men to come from afar, to whom a messenger was sent, and there they came. And you washed yourself for them, painted your eyes, and adorned yourself with ornaments. You sat on a stately couch with a table prepared before it, on which you set my incense and my oil. The sound of a carefree multitude was with her. The Sabaeans were brought from the wilderness with men of the common sort, who put bracelets on their wrists and beautiful crowns on their heads. And then I said, concerning her who had grown old in adulteries, will they commit harlotry with her now, and she with them? Yet they went in to her, as men go in to a woman who plays the harlot. Thus they went in to Ahola and Aholaba, the lewd women. But righteous men will judge them after the manner of adulteresses, and after the manner of women who shed blood, because they are adulteresses, and blood is on their hands. So after plainly stating the sins of Samaria and Jerusalem in the previous section, Ezekiel returned to the symbol of the harlot to represent their unfaithfulness to God. They happily and carefully prepared themselves for their unfaithfulness to God. They worshipped idols in comfortable and ornate surroundings. And God appointed sacred incense and oil for the service of the temple. Jerusalem was so corrupt that they took those sacred things and used them in idolatry. And so they loved their idolatry. Their rebellion against God made them feel carefree and popular with the multitude, like most of the people. Foreigners came and rewarded them for their idolatry. And so all the while they became like old, tired, worn-out prostitutes. Their young years of attractiveness and allure were a distant memory, and they were merely just lewd women. Their unfaithfulness to God made them age poorly. And so in Joshua chapter 9, verses 4 through 5, the verb bala is used of worn out sacks, wineskins, sandals, and garments. Sarah uses the term in Genesis 18, verse 12, to describe her own old age, specifically for having passed the age of childbearing. And the prophet's usage here implies that Aholaba's adulterous behavior has left her worn out. And so their illusion of glamorous prostitution could never last. Any righteous man could perceive that they were simply unfaithful adulteresses and that blood is on their hands. All right, verse 46 through 49, the sisters are judged as adulteresses. Verse 46, For thus says the Lord God, Bring up an assembly against them, give them up to trouble and plunder. The assembly shall stone them with stones and execute them with their swords, and they shall slay their sons and their daughters and burn their houses with fire. Thus I will cause lewdness to cease from the land, that all women may be taught not to practice your lewdness. They shall repay you for your lewdness, and you shall pay for your idolatrous sins. Then you shall know that I am the Lord God. So in a remarkably understated way, this refers to a literal invading armies that came against Samaria and Jerusalem. The punishment for adultery according to the law of Moses was execution. This penalty had been carried out against Samaria, and it was going to be carried out regarding Jerusalem. And so the punishment will be the common penalty for all adulteresses and shedders of blood, death by stoning, which is added uh, destruction of the property with fire. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 21. And so as stated before in Ezekiel 23, verse 27, the punishments of conquest and exile would have a cleansing effect upon Jerusalem and Judah. The particular sin of gross idolatry would never again be the same problem as it was before the exile. And the severity of conquest and exile had a purpose greater than punishment. It was to reveal God both by his holy judgments and gracious restorations. And that is chapter 23. Thank you for joining me.